It's a um, great pleasure to welcome you all here to IPI this morning. Uh, this is uh, a seminar that is organized uh, uh, between IPI, uh, the mission of Austria, and the mission of Norway. And the topic is, as you all know, uh, protection of civilians. And uh, we only need to go 20 years back uh, to sort of uh, remember the ultimate failure on protection of uh, civilians in Rwanda and later on in Srebrenica. And I do believe that uh, during those years we have learned a few lessons. But still today we know it's extremely dangerous to be in conflict areas. And in particular to be a civilian, of course, in conflict areas. Civilians are more likely be, to be affected by armed conflict today than ever before. Many of the conflicts we face today are highly complex and with a large number of actors. We see that, of course, most clearly probably in Syria today. The protection of civilians is therefore an, of increasing concern in many conflicts around the world. We see that medical personnel in conflicts are attacked. They are uh, brutally bombed. We know that in Syria, for instance, uh, medical personnel and hospitals have been uh, directly targeted on purpose, both by the opposition forces and by government forces. We know that systematic sexual violence is being committed against women and men, girls and boys. Schools and hospitals are uh, militarized and subject to targeted attacks. We have seen that in Afghanistan. Explosive weapons are used in densely populated areas. And these are, as we all know, grave violations of international humanitarian law. In other words, the threats are many and various. And it is therefore necessary that the international community approach the protection of civilians in a multifaceted and system-wide manner. Norway has a particular focus on the issue of sexual violence, the use of explosive weapons in densely populated areas, and the protection of healthcare and schools in conflict areas. Protection of civilians is at the heart of peacekeeping mandates. It is positive that this important issue has increasingly gained wider attention during the last years and also is shown in the turnout indeed for this seminar. We are very pleased that both the African Union and NATO are with us today and DPKO, and we hope this seminar will be a platform where we can share experiences, practices, and thoughts on how we can continue to improve the protection of civilians. One of the most important issues is how we turn the agreement in principle into practice. We see that the respect for humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law are dwindling on the ground and attacks against civilians are commonplace in contemporary conflicts. Therefore, it is even more important that we are here today to discuss different and concrete ways to protect the civilians who are innocently caught up in the line of fire. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm the Chargé d'Affaires of the Austrian Mission. And it is with, with particular pleasure that I welcome all of you uh, this morning uh, here to our seminar. Uh, this is not only because I'm convinced uh, that today's topic is of utmost importance to the United Nations, uh, to the African Union, to NATO, to other organizations and actors in this field, and of course to all troop contributing countries. But it is also because on a personal note, in a previous life, I have been posted uh, to beautiful Brussels, uh, Belgium, uh, two times. And I was uh, dealing at NATO headquarters, which are, as you know, in Brussels, with a sometimes complicated but always dynamic relationship between NATO and my uh, country, Austria, which, as you also know, is not a NATO member, but a participant, paid participant in the Partnership for Peace program. Against this background, I'm convinced that today's presence of high-ranking NATO uh, uh, representatives will definitely contribute 
uh, to the substance of our discussions, and I'm happy uh, to see you here uh, today, this morning. And these discussions are indeed necessary. As in the words of the Secretary General, I quote, the current state of the protection of civilians leaves little room for optimism. Civilians continue to account for the vast majority of casualties in current conflicts, end of quote. Today's conflicts have a devastating impact on civilians with dire, dire humanitarian and human rights consequences. As Ambassador Pedersen has already pointed out, they are characterized by much more complex scenarios than the traditional patterns of war, and it is civilians who have to pay the price. Also, in order to react to those realities, Austria decided to make the protection of civilians a pure priority during its membership in the Security Council uh, during, from 2009 to 2010. The last resolution on the protection of civilians, its Security Council Resolution 1894, was introduced by Austria and adopted under Austrian presidency in 2009. Since then, we have advocated consistently in various fora, such as the Special Committee on Peacekeeping Operations, for the full implementation of this resolution. Without taking away from our panelists' presentations, let me just say that NATO and the African Union have equally made substantial progress in incorporating the ethos of protecting civilians in their work and operations. As a non-NATO member, Austria, together with Norway, a NATO member, has set up a so-called TIGER team on the protection of civilians in the framework of NATO's Partnership for Peace program. The TIGER team is concentrating on areas where NATO and its Partnership for Peace can have an added value, especially in the field of developing lessons learned, strengthening international cooperation, and enhancing capacity building on POC. My compatriot, Brigadier General Reinhard Trischak, where is he? Ah, here he is, um, will later on present also Austria's efforts on activities in the area of POC training. We are thus delighted to have fantastic panelists and are sure that their presentations will stimulate interesting discussions and exchanges, as I said in the beginning. Last but not least, let me also express our gratitude to our partners, Norway and the International Peace Institute, and the excellent co collaboration in organizing the seminar over the last month, and to IPA for hosting us today in this great, but obviously a little bit too small, conference venue. Without further ado, let me now hand over to Assistant Secretary General Edmond Mullet, who is well known to all of us and doesn't need, I think, a lengthy uh, uh, introduction. Let me just say that he has extensive experience as Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations and has been reappointed by the Secretary General uh, to, in his position in 2011. Mr. Moulet has also served as SRSG and have head of MINUSTA in Haiti, and his career in the UN has been preceded by a career in his country, Guatemala, where he served, among others, as diplomat and as a member and president of Guatemala's National Congress. Mr. Moulet, we are very much honored that uh, you are here today, and please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, good morning. Um, Really, it's a real pleasure for me to be with you with you today, and I would like to thank uh, the missions of, of Norway and Austria and IPI for organizing this very important event. And I'm very happy to uh, kickstart the uh, the discussion of this very important uh, topic. Also, I think that the uh, the concept note that was prepared for this uh, meeting is very very good, and really uh, uh, condenses all the all the uh, analysis and all the needs we we have. Uh, for uh, the protection of civilian concept. Um, as we know, the, um, the, uh, the importance of protecting civilians 
uh, is a refrain now that we regularly hear from everywhere. Uh, the academia, the member states, uh, the Security Council, the General Assembly, NGOs, civil society from all over. And, uh, and we've seen this uh, recently in, uh, in our regular work uh, in the Central African Republic and uh, South Sudan and certainly in, in Syria. And the calls for the international actors to, to protect the uh, dispossessed, uh, this, these calls have never been so, so clear. And rarely uh, have the needs been so, so evident. Um, and also, as it has been said uh, about Gear, the, the nature of war and the nature of conflict right now is, uh, has make, is making uh, civilians extremely uh, vulnerable to, um, uh, to war and conflict. The, um, and it, with the phrase that SG has been using also recently about the current state of the protection of civilians leaves little room for optimism. And we can see that, for example, in our recent experience in, in South Sudan. Uh, the Secretary General ordered all the bases, all the offices, all our uh, installations in South Sudan to open in order to protect civilians that be, were being uh, uh, persecuted by different factions and different groups. And uh, at one point, we had 87,000 civilians in our installations in South Sudan. Now that, that has come down to 75,000, and we're there protecting them. Um, and this is just to show that we are um, trying to protect civilians, but I, sometimes I wonder if we have the right training, if we have the right tools in order to, to do so. And this is something that probably today should be discussed uh, in, in length. Uh, all the organizations here today, uh, certainly the UN, UN peacekeeping, uh, NATO, the African Union, and humanitarian actors have all uh, adapted and evolved uh, over the past two decades to a world in which civilians increasingly bear the brunt of terrible violence. It is true also that a, uh, a great deal of progress has been made, uh, as our panelists will discuss today. But uh, to begin today's discussion, I would like to highlight just how complex and nuanced a terrain we enter when we discuss the protection of, of civilians. For some, the uh, seemingly simple and noble aspirations behind civilian protection would imply a uh, straightforward method of execution, uh, simply establish the will to protect and good results will follow, if only the world were so simple. And effective protection requires both dynamic action and careful restraint. Sometimes, as we know in, in Rwanda, our protection efforts have fallen short because we have been too cautious or our troops were ill-equipped or under-resourced to take bold action. But just as important, however, is the guiding principle of protection, of protection that military operations, no matter how just, must be undertaken with due regard for the civilian population. International humanitarian law provides us with the minimum standards in this regard, but effective protection may require mitigating harm beyond the basic rules of international humanitarian law. Today we will hear from organizations such as UN Peacekeeping, and David Harry also will uh, ably represent uh, DPKO, uh, who often place troops uh, on the ground with the primary goal of protecting civilians. As the concept note uh, mentions, 95% uh, of our troops on the ground now are under a POC uh, mandate. The Security Council provided the first protection of civilians mandate in 1999 to the UN mission in Sierra Leone. Until then, peacekeeping mandates were often vague regarding the action to be taken when peacekeepers were confronted by violence against civilians. Such vagueness contributed to an action in Rwanda and the Balkans. As shown by the establishment of MINUSCA now in the Central African Republic and the ongoing situation in South Sudan, which I referred to, the international community increasingly turns to UN peacekeeping when action is needed to protect civilians. Since 1999, every new peacekeeping mission has been mandated to protect civilians with the exception of the short-lived unarmed monitoring mission in Syria uh, two years ago. There, we were there only for three months. But again, the questions are, 
uh, are things still valid? Are we really prepared? Are we really trained? Do we have the tools in order to execute these uh, very important mandates? And also, this important role creates uh, significant needs for and resources and training, ensuring that peacekeeping troops receive the training required to undertake protection of civilians' actions remains a challenge for UN and also for troop contributing countries and member states. Resources such as helicopters and other mobility assets are also exceedingly important. On the African Union, I can say that since its creation in 2001, the African Union has been increasingly important in a, an actor in international peacekeeping. Article 4 of the uh, Charter of the African Union makes it the first international organization to explicitly recognize the right of the Union to intervene in cases of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The African Union peacekeeping missions have consistently acted as first responders to crises on the continent, creating the stability and space for further international engagement, as we saw in Darfur, or in Mali, or in Central African Republic. In Somalia, the African Union's mission, AMISOM, has played a particularly important role in battling al-Shabaab and supporting the government of Somalia. These high-tempo military operations have pushed back militants and created space for civil authority. But as with many military operations against insurgents, they have carried the risk of civilian casualties. Mitigating and reducing such casualties has been an important area of work for AMISOM and the African Union. We also welcome representatives of, uh, of NATO at today's uh, discussion. Uh, through the experience of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan, ISAF, NATO has placed the protection of the civilian population at the core of many of its operations. Recognizing that civilian security can be a military necessity rather than an aspirational goal, NATO has developed many good practices to share with us today. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday with Ambassador uh, Stephen Evans and we're discussing some seminars and lessons learned that we can benefit from, and we're organizing some seminars uh, regarding the protection of civilians and also the risks related to asymmetric warfare. And we will hopefully be developing that very shortly during the month of, of July. But based on uh, what I have said so far, one might be led to believe that protecting civilians was a purely military task, but few things could be further from the truth. UN humanitarian agencies and NGOs have worked actively for many years to promote better practices and higher standards. Humanitarian organizations have been at the forefront of recent protecting, protection efforts, including establishing new standards for the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and tracking civilian casualties. Practices to mitigate harm to civilians are a main area of work in this regard. Cooperation between humanitarians and peacekeepers remain an essential element in protection efforts across the globe. These are not always easy conversations, and humanitarians and peacekeepers may have different perspectives, but they are vital to effective protection action. And I'm sure that today's discussions will help, help us to uh, work together in this very important topic. And thank you again for inviting me for this event. Thank you. As always, thank you very much, uh, Ed. Pleasure <coughs> listening to you. With your, your experience, we couldn't have a better man introducing the topic. Um, if you wonder um, who this uh, gentleman sitting to my right and left are, you have a wonderful speaker's biography that you should have uh, be seeing. And if I were to read all of this, it would take the whole meeting, so I will not do that. But it's a really a pleasure being here leading this uh, seminar, because we have uh, made a very democratic choice. Here I have two civilians, and here I have two military men. So I think we have, uh, not only do we have two uh, civilians and two military, but we have also they representing different traditions and different organizations. Uh, David, sitting on my right-hand side, is a very experienced UN man, 
and he is now uh, responsible for uh, uh, planning uh, and policy. Policy and evaluation training. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and but uh, you will also see that he has been uh, working in many, many different uh, areas. Ambassador Stephen Evans, sitting here, is Assistant Secretary General in NATO, but he has also uh, years of experience uh, from the British uh, Foreign Service. He has served as a High Commissioner uh, different places, uh, both in, uh, in Asia uh, and has mostly in Asia, actually. And you, I also noticed that you have worked also in Vietnam in the early days. So uh, a broad and, and good experience. And then it's uh, a pleasure having on my left-hand side a distinguished military man, Colonel uh, Mathuri Hugo, who has a very long experience as uh, a military man uh, in Kenya, and he's now the military advisor to the Kenyan uh, mission. Indeed, a pleasure having you here, Colonel. And then we actually have a real uh, military pilot sitting on my very left-hand side. Uh, Captain, you have even written a book, I've been told. It's called In the Claws of the Tiger. And uh, you told me before the meeting that the book, unfortunately for a few of us, is only in French. But I'm sure after this, uh, it will even be available in English. <laughs> Captain Ebla, it's a real pleasure having you here. You have uh, combat experience, both from Afghanistan and from Libya. Uh, David, I would suggest that uh, you start. You have uh, heard quite a few of the challenges already being mentioned, and we're looking forward to hear your wisdom. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you to uh, the organizers and to IPI uh, uh, for this opportunity, and, and thank you all for your, your interest in what is obviously a critical role for uh, the United Nations. I won't reprise um, uh, the various challenges, uh, demands, and the centrality of the mandate, which uh, is represented by uh, the Protection of Civilians mandate in UN peacekeeping. Um, I think um, Assistant Secretary General uh, Mulet has already uh, done that. Uh, the fact that over 90 percent of our troops are uh, carrying this mandate, the fact that they're trying to fulfill this mandate in situations where we have ongoing strife, sometimes uh, very weak or non-existent uh, peace agreements, trying to do it across huge geographic areas uh, with limited mobility uh, and, uh, and, and the like. Those are some of the the challenges. I think what's been important over the last uh, seven or eight years in the UN has been that um, we've really tried to come to grips with what uh, the nature of the challenge is and how best we can uh, prepare ourselves. There's been a long cycle of uh, intensive lessons learning, which has then uh, developed into uh, discussions with member states around the overall concepts that should guide us in uh, delivering on these mandates, which have then devolved into policy guidance uh, frameworks being developed and training and capability. And I think that uh, I'll say a little bit about that and then some of the ongoing and emerging uh, challenges. Um, we have, over the last uh, eight years or so, developed policy and guidance frameworks to create what we think is a coherent and consistent understanding of protection of civilians across the missions, or I should say at least as coherent and consistent as can be had in what is extremely messy, extremely difficult uh, and challenging situations which vary uh, greatly from, from uh, place to place. We've developed training and, uh, and capability requirements to ensure that our missions have the resources and capacities uh, needed to protect civilians, or at least uh, where they don't have the necessary resources, that they are prioritized those against the highest uh, order threats. We've had our uh, developed guidance so that our missions will uh, themselves prepare cross-mission uh, protection of civilians strategies, which identify uh, the basic threats, uh, prioritize them, and create a whole of mission approach using the military, the police, and all the civilian tools uh, of, uh, of the mission and, and beyond. Um, we've stressed the development of policy and guidance because one of the early challenges we faced when we embarked upon this process of lessons learning uh, was that there are very varying understanding of all, uh, across the international community as to what protection of civilians means. And I think we'll even hear in this panel, uh, there are some differences when it comes to organizational approach. Uh, organizations that are involved in, in, uh, in, strictly speaking, the focus on the IHL understanding of protection of civilians 
very important as it is, really focuses on the idea of doing uh, no harm, of mitigating the risk of civilians while engaged in ongoing military operations. Our peacekeepers must, of course, abide and, and, and be very careful uh, to uh, ensure that uh, international humanitarian law is met. But they actually have a proactive mandate. In other words, their mandate is also to protect civilians against a third party proactively and not just minimize harm to civilians as they carry out their ongoing operations. And so we've really worked to try and ensure a consistent and coherent uh, approach. We realize that our peacekeeping missions bring a formidable array of resources and capabilities. And so uh, in addition to that uh, distinction I just made, our approach to protection of civilians demands that all of the strengths of the mission are brought to bear. Uh, civilian, uh, military, and, uh, and police, as I mentioned. And thus we have a, what we call a three-tiered approach to protection of civilians. First, and I think arguably foremost, we stress that protection uh, is achieved through political processes. The most important contribution we can make to protection is achieving peace, local level peace, national peace. Without it, everything we do to provide pr protection will not be enough. Uh, and, and, and with it, uh, the, 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 the ability then of uh, the state to begin to build upon that peace, begin to build its own structures to protect civilians, uh, can come to bear. What protects us when we walk out into the streets t today is a functioning state. And ultimately, that is what will protect uh, civilians in the place we are located. Uh, in. And so the political process is, the, is sine qua non. And we need to understand that um, this means uh, engaging with regional countries. It means engaging uh, using the leverage of the council. Of course, it means engaging using all of the leverage of the mission on the ground at the national and, and uh, sub-national level. Secondly, of course, we recognize the importance of physical protection, what we call the second tier. What we can do to interpose ourselves, to engage, to actually provide uh, physical protection to civilians under imminent uh, threat. And often that clause in the Security Council mandate uh, to protect civilians under imminent threat uh, is, is really where the physical protection element of the mission uh, comes into, the, into focus. And of course, it needs to be understood that if you are a civilian trapped in ongoing strife and you see blue helmets arrive with weapons in their hands, the one most important salient difference that they offer compared to other tools of the international community uh, to you as a civilian in this situation is the physical protection element. And so it's important that the mission be forward leaning with in this regard and do its utmost in this regard. This is the unique capacity of armed peacekeeping operations. But third, the third tier, is that peacekeeping missions also support the building of a protective environment through our work on the rule of law, uh, police assistance, the work of human rights officers in terms of advocacy, monitoring, uh, building institutions that protect human rights. Uh, these are all the things which ultimately also allow for sustainable protection of civilians. And we do believe that our protections mandates require us to take this holistic approach. Um, that means also that our protection of civilians needs to emphasize planning and preparation. And that's why all of our high tempo uh, operations have developed comprehensive strategies, as I mentioned, to protect uh, civilians. And these strategies begin with a threat assessment. Which of the civilians most are likely to be uh, under threat? Prioritizing the actions of the mission across those three tiers to meet those threats. And I should say, not just the mission. When we developed the, the guidance framework, and I want to speak a little bit about the question of humanitarian space, which was mentioned earlier. When we developed the guidance framework on how missions should work out their protection strategies, we had a discussion with our humanitarian partners. And we said, should we develop a, a strategy for the whole of the UN, or should this be for the mission? And our humanitarian partners said, no, no, uh, we already have a well-developed doctrine, well-developed approach on, the, on protection, which is embodied in the protection cluster. And so we said, fine, we'll develop guidance on how missions should have a protection strategy for the mission. The humanitarian community will continue to work through the protection cluster, but there need to be at least three bridge points between them, or we are failing the people in need. The first bridge point is we need to be able to share information on threats. If one side of the community on the ground sees threats that the other side doesn't see, something's wrong. The second is that we need to have a basis for uh, some kind of shared information um, and planning so that we can at least understand how we would plan in a crisis uh, situation. And the third is some kind of platform for shared action when the time comes. 
Then some humanitarian actors need more space from the mission, and we don't dispute that. But we should at least be ready to act quickly to the extent that we want to act based upon shared information and a shared analysis. And that is something which I think uh, we are seeing in quite effective ways. Uh, for example, UNMISS has a coordination strategy which brings the humanitarian uh, elements together with the mission. MONUSCO has worked in this regard, et cetera. Um, so right now, uh, UNIMID, UNMISS, MONUSCO, UNOSI, UNMIL, and UNIFIL all have uh, comprehensive protection strategies. MINUSMA and MINUSCA are working on this. Uh, there are two missions which, uh, which don't, but they are uh, somewhat sui generis, uh, MINUSTA and UNISFA, uh, and that's uh, specific to the nature of those missions. Uh, that they, they haven't developed a separate protection of civilian strategy, but they have the mandate, and of course, uh, they, they fulfill it. I can speak more to that. Uh, we've also developed what we call a resource and capabilities matrix, because we want missions to look at the resources they have, align them to the threats that they identify, but also come back to us where there are gaps. And this is very important because you know, the, it, this can't be a fire and forget mandate where the mission is given the mandate and then the resources don't come. And the Secretary General goes year after year asking member states for the helicopters that are needed, for the mobility, et cetera, for the technological ability for us to, to observe and, and, uh, and, and move uh, to the locations where there are threats. So it is important that the missions also come back to us and we come back to the Security Council to go back to that fundamental Brahimi principle that mandates must be matched with resources. Uh, and this is absolutely vital. Missions cannot hide behind the fact that they don't have sufficient resources. Ultimately, we will never have sufficient resources, hence the importance of a political solution. Within our resources, we have to do our utmost. But beyond that, we have to be clear that there are limits, and there, were, there are limits. I think it's important to recognize why UNMISS at the moment is not day in and day out uh, being charged with being a failure in protection of civilians. I think the reason is that everyone recognizes that this mission is doing all it can to protect the 70,000 within its bases and is trying to push out beyond that. But there's a limit to what a mission can do as a country is bent on civil war and political tools will have to come into play. But where missions aren't able to show that within their resources they're doing their utmost, I think they get into difficulties and we can also name cases uh, uh, where, where that is the case. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to wrap up quickly because I don't want to take too much time, but I would just want to say that guidance development and uh, planning is only part of our approach. We've developed a range of training materials from strategic briefings to force commanders, operational guidance to military planners, tactical guidance for infantry commanders. We just wrapped up in Austria a training session uh, based uh, uh, on, on this tactical level uh, guidance. These training uh, materials involve scenarios drawn from real life experiences of our soldiers and civilian colleagues. And we try to tailor our training to a specific mission context because of course, uh, South Sudan, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Congo, these are all uh, very different uh, situations. We've worked um, with, closely with more than a dozen international peacekeeping training centers, and we now have a new concept called mobile training teams, which involve trainers from member states who then move out to do training of trainers so that this can be propagated across uh, the, 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 the family of, of TCCs. Maybe a word about emerging issues. Obviously, the situation in South Sudan has created a lot of stress and, and thinking uh, in the system. As, as was mentioned, um, we, we are dealing with uh, tens of thousands of civilians in our premises. And, I, and, and, and as Mr. Mullet said, the mission made the right choice to, to open the premises. But it's worth noting that um, these are, of course, only a fraction of the millions of pe uh, the million people displaced by by violence, and so there needs to be obviously a comprehensive humanitarian effort. And I should say that UN coordination between the mission and humanitarians has been exemplary and something we need to draw lessons from in the UNMISS uh, case. Indeed, humanitarian actors who normally would not have been in UN bases, of course, because the humanitarian principle requires them to, are now working within our bases and working very closely uh, with us. We should note, though, that this is hardly the first time that peacekeepers have faced the challenge of civilians seeking refuge. In Darfur, the DRC, previously in South Sudan, there are more than a dozen instances of large-scale protection at UN uh, bases. Well, my memory, at least uh, individually, goes back even to Timor uh, in uh, 1999 and before that. And we need to expect that. Indeed, we would be doing something wrong if, if civilians weren't coming to us looking for protection. But that means we need to plan, because it won't always be the case that we can open the gates. In 
some cases, we may be overrun if we open the gates. And obviously, we're seeing the, the, the situation that UNMIS is facing now, dealing with uh, the residual challenges of potential disease, uh, crime, etc. So we need also to plan for other options as well. The key is that missions plan for them proactively and understand that this is likely uh, to uh, happen. Civilians are likely to, uh, to come uh, to them. Um, on DRC, I would just say a word as well. Obviously, um, DRC has been a, a lab, a training ground for us. Many of the principles around coordination, planning, et cetera, uh, were principles that were innovated from the field. I should have said that at the outset. As much as we tout the guidance and training, uh, we are indeed learning from the innovations of the of the field. And of course, MONUSCO now is, 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 is trying uh, to deal with a new mandate since 2013, uh, where the Security Council provided the mission with the political and military mandate uh, it was given, including the Force Intervention uh, Brigade. Um, I would say that you know, there are new elements to this mandate, particularly the, the, the um, identification of armed groups that need to be uh, disarmed and neutralized. But I would say, in many respects, the real strength of MONUSCO is that it's been empowered to support the government to protect civilians. And nearly all of the mission's operations, even with the FIB, have been undertaken in support of the Congolese Army, the FARDC, and stabilizing Eastern Congo, including through supporting justice institutions and other stabilization elements to bring the state in to fill the, the vacuum, have been a core part of the overall uh, strategy. And Resolution 2098 uh, emphasizes this importance of developing Congolese protection uh, strategy, even while the FIB and the framework nations continue to carry out uh, the protection mandate. And I should say that MONUSCO's non-military tools have been essential also. The human rights due diligence policy in improving the behavior of the FIRTC uh, commanders on the ground, that the prosecution support cell empowering Congolese justice officials, uh, to bring charges against those responsible, including in the FARDC, uh, for violence against uh, civilians. Uh, so I think that uh, it's important to see the full context again, and this goes back to the three-tiered approach which I was uh, mentioning at the outset. Uh, finally, a couple of, uh, of points. I just think, in conclusion, I think it's very important for us to uh, recognize um, both the dual requirement of on the physical protection side, the mission to lean forward into it. It will need to take risks. We are going into higher risk environments, and we need to understand that. But also not to uh, limit the focus of the international community on the POC mandate, because ultimately, without a political solution, the POC mandate will be a palliative of some kind, will be a Band-Aid of some degree of effectiveness, but it will not provide uh, the solution. And of course, this is what uh, we face currently in UNMIS, uh, in the UNMIS case. A mission doing its utmost, uh, bringing in more forces to try to do more, but ultimately we will need to find uh, that political solution, which of course then brings the council, uh, brings the regional organizations and regional uh, picture in, 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 into the, the fold. And the last thing I would say is I do think that there are elements with regard to the use of modern technologies which are important here. If we can see and move uh, to the locations we need to move to, uh, that is important. Large static deployments will not do the trick in many of the environments which we're in. And this will be an important aspect of uh, our work going forward as we try to press into, let's say, the next frontiers of our work on, on protection of civilians. Uh, and finally, I think the, 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 the point I would, make to ma would like to make is uh, embodied in the Secretary General's focus on our rights up front, which is that ultimately this is about a mindset, it's about leadership, and it's about an approach which highlights and, 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 and prioritizes uh, the protection of human rights within a broader uh, context. And uh, I think missions have always had that responsibility, um, but I think that uh, the question of how they implement them is uh, as much to do with those uh, uh, intangible elements as any of the other uh, elements I mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you <coughs> very much indeed, uh, David. And I, I think uh, we will have many issues to uh, discuss with you later on. But thanks also for highlighting the importance of uh, the political process. That this is about, so it is eventually about state building and to make sure that actually we we are helping the societies to, to run themselves. That's the ultimate goal. Ambassador uh, Evans, uh, we are now uh, keen to listen to you and to hear what kind of experiences NATO has from this field. Thank you. 
Ambassador, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning, great pleasure to be in New York on this wonderful spring morning, um, but great to have the opportunity to interact with you as we address you know, these very, very important issues. Um, NATO is a political and military alliance, and um, we found ourselves conducting major military operations over the last 20 years. And that is, if you like, the basis for the remarks that I'm going to make um, over the next few minutes. Let me start with an assertion, um, and that is that NATO operations are planned and conducted strictly in accordance with all applicable international law and conventions. In cases where not all allies are party to the same agreements, such as the optional protocol to the Geneva Accords, NATO adopts the maximalist approach, not the lowest common denominator. So we believe that we position ourselves appropriately from the legal point of view. That's the theory, but what we now need to look at is the practice. The protection of civilians has been a fundamental NATO priority since we began operations 20 years ago in the Western Balkans. And there are two dimensions to this. The first is where um, the protection of civilians is the mandated focus of an operation which NATO is conducting. And the second is NATO's determination to protect civilians in the course of operations um, which it is carrying out. They are related issues, but they're not exactly the same. And so I think it makes sense to address each of them in turn. And let me start with protecting civilians as the mandated focus of a mission. If we go back to the early 90s, um, we see NATO conducting operations sharp guard and deny flight in the skies over former Yugoslavia. That leads on to the conduct in Bosnia and Herzegovina of um, opera the I-4 operation, implementation force, and then the S-4 operation, stabilization force, which were carried out by NATO under UN Security Council resolution cover to enforce the Dayton Peace Accords. The aim was to ensure that people of all ethnicities could enjoy security and could rebuild lives that had been threatened by ethnic cleansing. What I would highlight with both I-4 and S-4 is that these were militarily very muscular operations. Um, we deployed armor and um, sophisticated weaponry um, the commander of I-4 and the commander of S-4 was given something called the silver bullet. What that meant was that the commander was empowered to determine whether particular groups or factions or individuals were implementing or not implementing the Dayton Accords and take action if they were not implementing the Dayton Accords. One of the lessons out of all this is that I-4 and S-4 very rarely had to use force. Um, their presence and the way they discharged their mission was enough, and they began to create the security circumstances which allowed a return to normality in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, that was followed by the operation in Kosovo, where NATO launched Operation Allied Force um, to end the repression of Kosovo's uh, non-Serb population. Um, the objective was primarily to protect 800,000 ethnic Albanians who had been displaced in and from Kosovo, and that objective um, was achieved through the use of air power. That air campaign was followed by the deployment of KFOR, the Kosovo force, which was a NATO-led force um, with a mandate to provide a safe and secure environment in which pe people of all ethnicities could rebuild their lives and move on socially and politically. Interestingly, while the original air campaign in Kosovo was designed to protect the Albanian population, 
um, the focus of K4 has been to protect um, Kosovo's non-Albanian minorities, Serbs and Garanis, um, at a time when Kosovo itself um, was becoming an independent state, so recognized by many but not all members of the international community. Um, so what K4 has done is to help create a security space within which political processes can move. And we are now seeing real progress in the relationship between Belgrade and Pristina, um, real progress in an EU-sponsored dialogue between prime ministers and between governments um, that I think does offer um, the people of Kosovo and indeed the people of Serbia a new future. So there you're using force to, well, the, the the ability to use force if you need to, to create security space for political movement to the benefit of, I think, all communities. Even more recently, um, we've had Operation Unified Protector um, in Libya. Um, that operation was launched when Benghazi, um, Libya's second city, was about to be attacked by Gaddafi's forces. And NATO's action in Libya succeeded the measure of that success is that Benghazi and other urban centers didn't suffer the fate that was subsequently to befall Aleppo and Homs. And if you just recall um, what you saw on your television screens last night or a few nights ago of what is happening in Syrian cities, and then realize that if NATO hadn't intervened in Libya, that is what would have happened to Benghazi. And then that, I think, um, is a quite a vivid illustration of what the judicious use of force can achieve. Um, we did go to very great lengths to ensure that the um, airstrikes in Libya um, can inflicted an absolute minimum of civilian casualties. Um, and I think the statistics would show that we largely succeeded in that. Um, I'd also highlight the fact that um, in Libya, we moved into a new area of cooperation with international organizations and non-governmental organizations. At the beginning of the operation, um, we opened in the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, which is the military, NATO's military top level headquarters. Um, we opened in Shapes Operations Center, um, a area um, that was designed to um, accommodate representatives of international organizations and NGOs to enable them to coordinate with um, NATO to ensure that our operations did not conflict with their interests and to protect the interests and safety of their own representatives on the ground, people who were transporting humanitarian aid by sea and by air um, into Libya at a time when the conflict was underway. That proved effective, and in fact it proved so effective that SHAPE, um, who have now uh, reconfigured their operation center, have included in the um, reconfigured sp um, operation center space and computers for the use of representatives of international organizations and NGOs if it should be necessary in a future conflict. Let me now just turn briefly um, to the second dimension of um, uh, civilian protection, um, which is the mitigation of civilian harm in the um, course of NATO combat operations. And I'd just like to focus on Afghanistan. And I know that um, uh, Captain Erbland is going to be um, going into this in a little bit more detail later, so I'm not going to say too much now. Um, but in Afghanistan, um, we have our overall objective, which is to ensure that Afghanistan never again is a safe haven for terrorism. Um, from the point of view of international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict, NATO's obligation is that any civilian deaths or injuries or damage to civilian property or infrastructure must not be excessive in relation to the military advantage anticipated. So that, if you like, is the minimum, and I emphasize the word minimum legal standard. 
actually, um, we've realised that we need to go beyond that legal standard and to do um, our utmost to um, minimise civilian casualties. There is a moral imperative to do that. There's also a political imperative to do that, because if there are civilian casualties, you erode support for your mission amongst the local population and also in your own domestic um, constituencies. When NATO first took over um, responsibility for um, security in Afghanistan from October 2006, I think it struggled a bit um, to minimize civilian casualties. And if you look at the period 2006 to 2008, something in the region of 40% of civilian casualties were caused by um, ISAF, by NATO-led forces. Uh, most of those casualties um, uh, resulted from close air support ground attack missions. In August 2009, General Stanley McChrystal, who was the um, uh, commander of ISAF, carried out a fundamental review of the, op of the mission, and he basically set a major adjustment in course. Um, he redefined the mission as a population-centric counterinsurgency mission, which means that if you are in a situation where there are insurgents and there are civilians, the commander on the spot gives primacy to the protection of the civilians. And if that means not engaging the insurgents, you don't engage the insurgents. Um, and that did start to make a difference. Um, a subsequent commander, General Allen, put it very succinctly a couple of years later in October 2011 when he said, I'm fully and utterly committed to doing everything in ISAF's power to eliminate civilian casualties. Now, that's not to reduce, not to mitigate, but to eliminate. Um, we've never totally reached that goal, um, but where we are now, um, the end of 2013, um, during that year, 1% of civilian casualties had been caused by ISAF. The other 99% were caused by others, but not by ISAF. So we have moved very much in the right direction. And that's the result of training, guidance to forces, tactical directives, um, constant attention by top-level leadership to targeting and to operational methods, and changing the mindset of the military. It's not about going after the insurgents. It's about protecting the civilians who are themselves threatened by those insurgents. Um, we're now moving to the end of the ISAF mission. It will conclude on the 31st of December 2014. Um, the Afghans are now in the lead for security. At the end of this year, they will take full um, responsibility for security in Afghanistan. So our focus as we move into the process of training, advising, and assisting the Afghan armed forces is to help train them to ensure that when they take forward the counterinsurgency operation, they do it in ways that minimizes the risks to civilians. And we will have a post-2014 non-combat NATO-led train, advise, and assist mission. And one of its um, primary objectives will be to help the Afghan National Security Forces develop and implement tactics and strategies that minimize the risk to civilians. As that ISAF mission um, draws to a close, um, it's imperative that we don't lose the lessons that we've learned. Um, we need to identify those lessons and properly um, absorb them. And therefore, the North Atlantic Council, the governing body of NATO, has tasked the NATO military authorities, and I'll quote, undertake an in-depth lessons learned process on how ISAF significantly reduced its civilian casualties and encouraged the Afghan National Security Forces to do the same. To serve as a basis for developing NATO doctrine and guidance on the protection of civilians and by our own forces and also to help us train indigenous forces in this important task. Now, as this work's taken forward, we're not just learning our own lessons. We're also consulting partners in the international community, the United Nations system, ICRC, NGOs like the Center for Victims in Conflict and Human Rights Watch to get their views on what ISAF did and to learn lessons from them um, because we need to learn as 
widely as possible, whilst at the same time sharing what we have learned um, with those who have an interest in the mounting of operations and interventions to protect human life and to protect civilians. And I would think that this meeting is just an element in that wider process. And I'm very keen that when I leave here with my colleague Rob Iassi from NATO HQ, um, that we take away um, ideas and we learn lessons from what is said today because that forms part of the wider uh, lessons learned ex uh, exercise. And I look forward to participating in the discussions that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ambassador Evans. And uh, thanks for sharing with us your experience from how to reduce civilian, uh, civilian uh, casualties in, in Afghanistan. As you all know, that has been a major debate and has also been a major issue in the relationship between uh, the Karzai government and the international community. And I'm sure there are many issues to be followed up in the discussion uh, later on. Colonel Kyugo, you have a lot of experience from um, uh, DRC, where you played a le leading role within the UN operation there. You also participated in negotiating uh, with the, the rebel uh, groups there. We also know that Kenya plays a crucial role in uh, Amazon and is indeed one of the leading forces there and uh, also uh, behind the uh, recent successes of Amazon in sort of increasing the territory for uh, the government in, in, in Somalia. Very much looking forward to listen to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I first of all want to thank the permanent missions of Norway and Austria, together with IPI, for organizing this seminar today. I also want to take this moment and appreciate a distinguished uh, gentleman who have spoken um, before me. And um, I, will, I will try as much as possible not to repeat what, um, what they, have, um, they have said. Uh, when I was called by my friend uh, Brigadier General Franz last week, um, to come and um, share my experience with you. I was, uh, first of all, hesitant um, because of the short notice. I told him this is an ambush. <laughs> and I, I, I have forgotten my ambush drills because I've been out of uniform for a while. But nevertheless, uh, I want to start by saying that um, I think since the reorganization of uh, the um, African uh, reorg Organization of African Unity to AU as it stands today, we have seen a lot of changes in terms of um, thinking um, how the continent can be able to um, take care of the problems um, facing our, our countries. I think um, being members, all of us here, being members of um, countries that um, form the international community, we all remember what happened in Rwanda. And I think that is the time um, the world started um, asking what could have been done better to protect the number of civilians that were killed in Rwanda. The African Union, within its um, meager resources, is trying as much as possible to respond to crises and conflicts in Africa. Unfortunately, almost 90% or thereabout uh, of conflicts we are dealing with are in Africa. And uh, therefore, when the AU uh, talks about um, Africa um, dealing with, I think, African problems, does not sorry mean that um, Africa should be left on its own to deal with the problems that are facing us. I think it means that um, we need to be more proactive. First of all, try as much as possible 
to address the problems before calling uh, the international community to come and help. I think when, when your house is burning, you will try as much as possible to put off the fire with what is available before the neighbors can come to help or even before the, um, before the fire, uh, the firemen can bring the fire tenders to put off um, the, the, the fire. I think we heard from um, Mr. Mulet that um, the AU has contributed troops to Somalia, to Central Africa Republic, to Darfur, to Mali. But uh, I would just want to reiterate what has always been said about this, because the biggest problem that we have is not uh, personnel. The biggest problem that um, African countries face is lack of resources. As we are talking today, EGAN and member states have requested the UN to provide the required logistics support and they will be if that is required if that is if, if that is availed um, Kenya, Rwanda and Ethiopia are ready to provide troops to an EGAN force that will be able to um, protect the group that will be doing the verification in South Sudan. Talking about Kenya, our chief of defense forces was here um, last week, and he made it very clear that um, we have 1,000 personnel standing as we talk today, but if we have resources, they will move as quickly as possible to try uh, to um, South Sudan to help you know, the, uh, through the intervention. Now, um, let me talk about a um, little bit about uh, my experience and that of the uh, Kenyan Defense Forces uh, serving in peacekeeping missions around the world. We have been involved in this for a long period of time including the um, former Yugoslavia that has been talked about here by um, Evans. And today we are participating in missions in uh, MONUSCO, uh, UNMIS, UNAMID, and of course uh, the African Union mission in Somalia. Having served with the UN mission in DRC, which used to be called Monuk in 2003-2004, and after a few visits to um, UNMIS, where Kenya is currently deploying a battalion, I want to say that um, the protection of civilian process is easier at times said than done. The Security Council authorizes missions with the mandate to protect, and it is expected that DPKU and DFS in conjunction with the mission leadership draft policy and strategic guidance, and that has been already explained by um, David, that uh, it is ongoing and um, missions, missions should have um, clear guidance. From the strategic level, we should have a strategic guidance and from the operational level, we should have a um, um, concept of operations, which provides military guidance to contingents deployed to that particular mission, all the way to the tactical level, because it's, it's at the tactical level that the implementation of POC mandates is carried out by the troops that understand the tactics, techniques, and the procedures of doing this. At times, this is, this is missing, but I'm very, very happy that um, and David has talked about it, um, but um, probably the, the relationship from the operational level to tactical level needs, uh, the gap needs to be bridged, because when I spoke with, my, with our commanding officer in Juba, and I asked him if he had any um, operational concept from the force headquarters 
um, before in deploying the company to go and uh, protect civilians in Juba, um, he told me what he has is, um, is, is a concept plan. And a concept plan is totally different from a concept of operations. Uh, let me talk about um, the probably uh, proactive, uh, the proactive me uh, measures. I think it is evident that early preventive action is the best form of POC. All stakeholders must take action to complement the military component, and MONUSCO adopted a unique method of, uh, of course, encouraging locals to use cell phones to share information when they are in imminent danger, and this action has saved lives and minimized incidents of attack <coughs> on civilians. It's extremely, extremely um, encouraging. To achieve the POC mandates, missions are, to my opinion, required to mobilize civilian, police, and military resources with the aim of remaining proactive. There are times when, as a Razzis, Last resort, missions must use force in order to respond to attacks on civilians in a timely manner. And I, I know this, this has always um, uh, been contentious. I'm aware that uh, issues such as when to use force and what quantum remains a thorny issue, but there is need for honest discussion between uh, the, in the Security Council, troop, and the police contributing countries regarding this challenge. Without clear understanding <clears throat> between these entities, redeployment of troops in the mission areas will continue to impact negatively on POC due to national caveats, commitment to rules of engagement, and then directive on the use of force. I want to share with you that um, my government, when we deploy troops to peacekeeping missions, we do not deploy them with caveats. And we place troops under the operational command of the force commander so that he can be able to, to switch them from any location, uh, to switch them to any location when need arises. What we may not accept is redeploying troops as light infantry without protection in missions that are under Chapter 7 mandates. I'll give you an example. In January 2014, our contingent commander was directed by the force and quarters in Unimis to redeploy a company or to detach a company to support um, operations in the Bor when it was extremely, extremely hot that time. It was um, difficult to do that because there was no helicopter, heavy helicopter, to lift the armored personnel carriers that would accompany the troops. And therefore, we advised that um, the mission should, first of all, be able to lift the equipment so that uh, when troops get on the ground, they can have proper protection. Otherwise, we normally allow the force commander to switch forces as an end arises. And uh, this, is, this is what I'm, um, um, I'm seeing, that there's need to have a dialogue uh, between what, I mean, between what we call, through what we refer to as uh, the triangular cooperation, so that, um, when you deploy troops with caveats, then the force commander is aware, is made aware that uh, when need arises, I will not be able to switch um, this contingent to support operations elsewhere, if that is acceptable. Projecting a mission presence through military activities, such as standing military and police patrols and other force deployments is a measure that has been implemented by all peacekeeping missions and is one of the most visible and reassuring forms of security that a mission can provide to the local population. 
In addition to acting as a deterrent to potential aggressors, it also allows mission personnel to build familiarity with the environment and better understand the concerns of population. It's projection, presence of military and police in areas that are threatened by rebels is extremely important. I don't think we want to say we are protecting civilians when they run away and come to the UN bases, when they run away and come to the camps. I think we will look at the, the UN will look better or peacekeepers will look better when they can be able to have their presence in areas where um, the population is able to do farming. For instance, talking about uh, South Sudan, the cultivation will not take place probably this time around because most of the people abandoned their farms and, and, and ran, ran away into IDP camps and uh, UN um, bases. But when you have a presence of the UN peacekeepers in those areas, then definitely they will have confidence and, and um, continue doing their normal, their normal activities. I think this is, what we, this is what we are talking about. I will talk about the use of technology to enhance what I've just said. You have unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned uh, aerial systems will provide commanders with real-time information required for the implementation of uh, POC mandates. I know, I know we can talk about this issue. Everyone in Africa will say we can talk about it until cows come home. They can be very useful when uh, protecting civilians and doing exactly what I have, I have explained. It was on Thursday last week when we were shown images during the morning briefing at the DPKU. We were shown images uh, from uh, MONUSCO where um, the, the information regarding a boat that was capsizing with civilians on Lake Kivu was transmitted, tra transmitted timely and all those majority of the civilians were, were rescued. So I wonder in this time and age if we shouldn't really still be seeing that um, deployment of uh, unmanned aerial systems is not, a, is not a good idea. I think um, um, David uh, talked about um, the lack of um, resources that is really making the implementation of POC mandates a little bit um, challenging. And I would say, I, I think there has been enough cry that uh, the Security Council continues to authorize mandates under Chapter 7 without providing the requisite resources to implement the mandate and tasks. Without the resources, missions will definitely not meet the obligations and expectations. In mandating uh, peacekeeping operations to protect civilians under imminent threat, the Security Council has often put kind of restrictions when the ones within capabilities and within their areas of deployment are used. Both these caveats are provisions that re recognize that peacekeeper, uh, peacekeeping operations have finite resources and cannot be expected to protect civilians from physical violence in all areas of um, operations. Within the broad range of resources required, perhaps the most cited is the need for the current shortfall in mobility assets, and particularly aviation assets. And I think I've given uh, a good example of where one of our um, subunits was required to move to a different locality to support. But because, we, because there was no heavy lift helicopter to lift the um, APCs, then this company did not move to help. So I, I, I'm certainly, if uh, the civilians were threatened, then uh, we might have lost um, lives because of, because of this. My experience 
in DRC is that um, missions that practice uh, civil military cooperation have succeeded in the implementing POC than those who tend to rival each other. Given that the POC is an endeavor that ne necessarily includes the participation of other actors, particularly the host government, an additional challenge for missions will be to ensure that the national authorities and other protecting state stakeholders resource and prioritize uh, protection. When I served in DRC 2003-2004, I was attached to um, human rights, child protection and, child protection and um, uh, humanitarian uh, groups to conduct investigations after the atrocities in the Ituri region. I was the liaison officer and uh, Kiswahili interpreter because the locals in that um, particular area speak Kiswahili. And uh, I can confirm that uh, it worked extremely well because of the, because of the, the, the mix of the individuals that were picked. In, we also had um, civil, uh, civilian police uh, officers. It worked extremely well because we could sit down after investi investigations, we could sit down and analyze and share. You know, and when we talked about um, um, rebel, uh, rebel groups that were in the Ituri area, and the, um, the group that I had could not understand. We also had, uh, we had a foreign uh, military force in the area, and they could not understand the difference between um, um, one a group wearing a similar uniform. I couldn't reach out. You no, know, I could reach out to their uh, specific uh, commanders and uh, ensure that the group uh, gets its right. Which which rebel group are we are we talking about? And therefore, this this kind of cooperation is extremely important. Let me talk quickly about uh, command command and control architecture. Decentralization, decentralization of command makes it easy for the force and quarters to have full control of the entire mission. South Sudan is by far bigger than the size of some European countries, yet UNMIS is not, is not sectant. It doesn't have sectors. Hand of military component require time to plan and do uh, analysis while sector commanders where we have sectors like in, uh, in, in MONUSCO uh, concentrate with the tactical level tasks of contingents under their areas of responsibility. I think my colleagues who are sitting here today, um, military, advisor, military and police advisors, who agree that um, we when we visited um, UNMIS uh, several times, I think we have raised this as a concern. And I think the, the last um, briefing we had from uh, the military advisor, DPKO, we understood that um, this, is, this is in the works, and uh, probably the mission will be able to be um, divided into, into sectors, because that is the only way that the command and control architecture can be able to be utilized um, well. Training is key, and um, those from the military community will agree with me that um, the best award you can give to your soldiers is training. Nothing better than that. And uh, the Kenya Defense Forces emphasizes on pre-deployment, pre pre clear pre-deployment training before troops are deployed to peacekeeping missions. I definitely others, others also do. Those who have visited um, Nairobi, the, yeah, the International Peace Support Training Center, we have a model of um, a peacekeeping village um, where we normally do demonstrations on the uh, protection of civilians uh, to all military, police, and civilian personnel that are deploying to missions. To conclude, let me remind that um, for Africa Union, of African Union to be able to probably address the conflicts that are in the continent, there's a urgent requirement for a standing, a standing force. Like we have heard from NATO, I don't want to, from NATO, I don't want to repeat that. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, it has been in the talks for several, several years now. Um, talking about uh, the African standby force, but 
the, a, number of, a number of regions have moved further. I will tell you that uh, East Africa, where Kenya is situated, has uh, fast tracked uh, the formation of the East Africa Standby Force. And hands of state met early this year, and they said it will not be it will not be standing in 2015, but it will be standing in December 2014. And uh, the um, hands of military component, of course, are on toes, are trying as much as possible to achieve that. Because without that, without that, then uh, probably we before the UN reacts to situations in Africa, we are likely to lose um, a number of lives before we constitute a peacekeeping mission. Thank you so much, Lassie. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Kyogo, and uh, thanks for reminding us about the continued need for an honest discussion about uh, these issues, and also for reminding us that there are different um, national practices when it comes to this, and that we need to address all of these uh, issues. You also uh, mentioned that it was at the tactical level that uh, protection of civilians is carried out, and I'm therefore very glad that we have uh, Captain Ebland here today, who uh, have experience uh, as a helicopter pilot, as I already mentioned, and have seen this uh, both from the air and ground, I guess, both in Afghanistan and, and in Libya. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad to be here with you in, in such a place and in front of such an audience. Um, I've been invited to talk about um, my own experience in protection of civilians in operations. Um, and I will try to explain you the lessons I've learned uh, during my fights. So my speech will focus on the tactical level. I've been committed twice in Afghanistan in 2011 and 2012, and once in Libya, like you said, during Unified Protector Operation in 2011. I was an attack helicopter pilot and a squadron commander, so I had many occasions to open fire, which is never an easy thing to do, because if these two operations was, were rather different for many reasons, um, there is one thing they had in common, the presence of civilians on the battlefield. And analyzing the fights I've, I'd led, I've learned three things that could help to protect civilians. A soldier, or actually any fighter, has to know the rules, the rules of engagement, that is the law, uh, needs a practical sense, a sort of uh, intellect, um, sort of tactical intelligence, and most of all, has to be human. Needs uh, a moral strength to face the evil feelings brought by the toughness of operations. And this last point will be uh, the main idea of my speech. But let's give some examples. Attack helicopters are often used in Afghanistan as a quick reaction force. We are called when the situation goes wrong. And that was the case in April 2011 when a, a French in infantry company was fixed in a village by a dozen of insurgents. I was flying around the village and I was not able to identify uh, the insurgents in the compo compounds or in the tight streets. And one of our soldiers was wounded, so I had to do something. But the risk of collateral damage was too high. And suddenly, all the insurgents went away from the village and crossed a waste ground next to the village to withdraw from the fight. Um, if the insurgents were easily identified at this moment, uh, holding weapons and ammunition, each of them was holding the hand of an Afghan child. So impossible to do anything. Because before any other consideration, the rules of engagement forbid to fire at civilians. It's such a case. The rules of engagement are the first shield to protect civilians. And so every soldier has to know them by heart. But in some cases, it is not enough. Another day in Afghanistan, during a similar situation, uh, we had three squads uh, engaged by two or three insurgents in a house. Two of these squads were on the roofs of uh, neighboring compounds, maybe 50 meters away, that is very close. And the third one was on a crest line next to it, and these soldiers were fixed 
hiding themselves behind little rocks. What could I do? Uh, open fire in the compound? And what if there were still civilians into it? Nobody knew. But because the lives of the soldiers were on stake, at stake, the rules of engagement would allow to open fire. That is a big question. What would you do? Save your country soldier lives or the local civilians lives? Here comes the practical sense I was talking about. The main goal was to protect our soldiers, to allow them to withdraw. Then there is a solution, what we call a suppressive fire. The idea is to prevent the enemy from using its weapon for a while. That's why I fired in front of the compound. Believe me, no insurgent is stupid enough to look through the window when 30 millimeter shells are blowing up in front of it. Of course, no insurgent was eliminated that day, but by firing in front of the compound, our soldiers um, were able to withdraw and we avoided any collateral damage. So in some way, uh, the practical sense of a soldier is the second shield. Uh, now, before talking about the third and most important shield, let me tell you about the evil feelings I was talking about. To me, there are three psychological dangers uh, the soldier can face with fighting experience. First of all, the feeling of vengeance. You know, <clears throat> there is not much more touching than hundreds of soldiers from many countries silently walking behind a coffin, or then holding the stretcher of a wounded soldier, or then cleaning a cockpit splashed of blood from a brother in arm. After these moments, when you call for taking off, the only thing you have in mind is vengeance. I think it's understandable. I mean, it's only human feelings, but it can be dangerous because it decreases the objectivity in the analysis. It leads to mix enemy and civilians because it makes you identify weapons wherever you want to. You know, there is nothing more similar to an Afghan insurgent than an Afghan farmer. And it, it reminds me of a funny story. Um, we were looking for a, a bad guy in the, in the Capisa Valley. Uh, it was in spring 2012, so there were a lot of leaves on the trees, and it was very difficult to watch on the ground and under the trees on the passes. And at one moment, there was a hole in the trees, I had a window, and I, I saw a man holding a long rifle like this. Um, so I, I took time because nobody was under fire. I warned everybody on the radio, and I turned around the, the place to look at him from a different angle. And when I saw him again, he was actually holding a shovel, a tool. So it's sometimes difficult. The second, second danger is the addiction to destruction. I experienced that in Libya, where at each sortie, we destroyed several dozens of combat vehicles. At a time, I returned to fight with a deep will to open fire and destroy something. This is very dangerous too, if you're not conscious uh, about it. And the third one is detachment, facilitated by the distance between targets and weapons, by the sites we, look, we use to look at the battlefield, all those technological improvements that move soldiers away from their human instinct. Because the consequence of all these traps is to lose humanity and become a killing machine. So how can we prevent soldiers from these dangers? I believe that I managed to avoid these traps thanks to my morale sense. I was once escorting two utility helicopters, lifting troops from a fob to another. And I was, as we were flying over a no man's land, the lead helicopter took evasive action and told on the radio there were two guys at his three o'clock 
holding a, a RPG. When I found them with my sight, they were hiding something in the rocks and then raised their hands looking at me. They were the two only guy in the area. There was no doubt. But I hadn't, I hadn't seen the weapon and these guys were looking at me with hands up. I did not open fire. Even if all the clues said they, they would be, they could be incidents. Some of my colleagues blamed me for it. You know, and what if tomorrow they try again and destroy a helicopter? But when I was turning around them with my gun pointed at them, I knew I would have lost my mind if I'd fired, you know, passing to the dark side. My moral sense dictated me not to open fire on men raising hands. So here we have our third shield, the moral strength of the soldier. Finally, if the knowledge of the rules can easily be improved by ther theoretical courses, if the practical sense can be improved by sharing experiences or studying concrete situations, how can we improve the moral strengths of soldiers? I think the answer is military ethics. I believe every soldier, from the private to the, to the officer, has to study, to read, to think about military ethics. Just imagine if the armies of every country would teach military ethics during initial education and before every commitment. I really think we would have a chance to save many lives. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Captain Erblem, for a very honest and for a civilian fascinating description of the moral dilemmas and challenges that you are facing when you are in the midst of a military campaign. I'm sure there will be many questions to follow up, and if you had brought your books, there would be uh, lots of opportunities to sell it. So think about that the next time you come to New York. <laughs> anyway, we already have uh, two who have uh, asked to take the floor, uh, uh, but I also uh, would ask you to prepare yourself. Please uh, make uh, brief uh, comments, if you have any, and uh, a short uh, question. I'm afraid, as always, we do not have, have much time. The first one who have asked for the floor is Mr. Rainer Trishak, and if you please also just present yourself. Uh, ambassadors, uh, generals, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, let me first of all <clears throat> thank the organizers for uh, inviting uh, me as a representative of the Austrian Ministry of Defense uh, and uh, give me a, an opportunity to share with you what we are doing uh, in trying to support the efforts uh, to implement protection uh, of civilians in armed conflicts. Um, I am the, uh, the director of the military policy division in the uh, Ministry of Defense, and I'm responsible for cooperation with international organizations, the United Nations, European Union, NATO, the OECE, but also cross-cutting uh, issues and topics like armaments, uh, disarmament, arms control, uh, security sector reform, DDR, uh, rule of law, uh, protection of civilians, the role of women in, in, in armed conflicts, uh, and so on. Uh, before I go into detail uh, and describe what we are currently doing uh, in close cooperation with DPKO, uh, please allow me a few general remarks. Uh, as the United Nations, also regional uh, organizations like the European Union uh, or NATO, and their members, uh, their member states, uh, have developed guidelines to better, better implement protection of civilians on the ground. Uh, I would like uh, to remind you of the EU statement uh, at the 2013 Security Council open debate on uh, protection of civilians uh, in armed conflicts. Uh, and this was, uh, <clears throat> we need to continue, and that's a quote, uh, we need to continue our efforts to translate normative progress into concrete improvements in the POC on the ground. So that's implementation. Uh, that's a key word out of this statement. For example, more guidance is necessary to ensure qualified reporting on PSC, POC as requested 
uh, in the Security Council resolution. Also, practical interdisciplinary training is deemed a cornerstone to improve the carrying out of protection tasks. And in this respect, <clears throat> I'm extremely pleased uh, to hear uh, from NATO um, that at the upcoming NATO Commanders Conference, POC is going to play an important role. Uh, also, the Tiger team at NATO, which has been mentioned before, uh, is an uh, extremely valuable uh, development. Given the still existing gap between legal frameworks and political ambitions and the actual implementation, uh, all crisis management actors should bring together their different approaches to explain POC for peace operation personnel. From my point of view, a standard level of knowledge is essential to ensure the implementation of POC on the ground. Now, <clears throat> in line with our, with the Austrian security uh, strategy uh, of 2013, uh, where POC plays a very important role, uh, we have decided uh, to suggest to the United Nations to conduct a series of different courses on protection of civilians. Uh, and I would like to briefly outline what, what we are doing. In 2012, <clears throat> Austria developed a comprehensive POC training course for operational level personnel, which is, of course, widely based on the UN specialized training materials. This comprehensive training program on POC addresses military, police, and civilians, practitioners from the headquarters, from operations. This, as I said, uh, is aiming at the operational level in international peace operations and takes into account the various perceptions and dimensions of POC. Second, uh, Austria has also provided a UN POC training of trainers course for peacekeeping training personnel in peacekeeping missions. And this course was developed by DPKO ITS uh, after having developed, uh, of course, shortcomings regarding POC implementation on the ground in peacekeeping missions. In the third course, uh, this was the first global uh, POC course, um, and I have just had the honor to contribute to the closing ceremony together with Raphael on Friday last week. This was a two, years, uh, two weeks course, and it has just uh, finished on Friday last week. At this global uh, training course, uh, on POC and child protection, uh, training personnel in peacekeeping training institutes is addressed. And the aim, of course, is to better qualify trainers to explain POC implementation to their contingents during pre-deployment training. Uh, I talked to many of the participants, almost to, uh, to all of them. Uh, there were 25 countries represented. Uh, Everybody shared the, uh, the view that POC pre-deployment training is necessary, but hardly any of them uh, has already implemented this training in pre-deployment training. Uh, and if any, then it's, it's an hour or two hours of slide presentation. Uh, we can do better than that. The content of the Austrian training programs is relevant uh, to most of the current peacekeeping operations, as POC has become a priority for most UN missions. As you're all aware, knowledge in this field among troops deployed in peacekeeping uh, missions and operations with a mandate to pre protect civilians is crucial for the mission's legitimacy and its success. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, lessons learned and strategies and guidelines concerning POC are comprehensive and must be disseminated and implemented as widely as possible in order to protect civilians. Now, we feel very privileged uh, to be selected to, have, uh, to, to act as a host for this, for this first global uh, POC course. Uh, and we certainly offer uh, any uh, contribution from our, from our side for future cooperation. And I would also like to extend an invitation to all countries uh, present in this room uh, to uh, contribute and send participants to the, to the, to the upcoming courses. Uh, I will, I will stop here. I heard the time is, is running out, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> uh, it's also a pleasure to have here the, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Speakers, Norway, Austria. Um, 
Two points. Uh, firstly, DPK, I think, in particular, deserves tremendous praise for uh, tremendous progress in helping to systematize and professionalize POC over the last few years, and David, I think, in particular. Um, nevertheless, in parallel to that, we would say that um, the, the most important tool for POC remains, we feel, political pressure. Um, I know from my own time in numerous conflict situations that um, the, the perception of the parties to a conflict that myself as an individual, my organization behind me, um, has political standing, has political strength, makes all the difference. It makes a massive difference. Um, parties to conflict, including at a very, very local level, as I recall talking with one gender lead leader in, uh, in, in Southern Darfur, parties will change the way they act if they perceive that the, the UN and the individuals have political standing. Political pressure is vital. The second point then, how do we generate political pressure? Um, we do it through various means, including, for instance, um, investigations of human rights and IHL violations, reporting, advocacy, political engagement by different parts of the UN in the field and at headquarters. There's a very sophisticated system for doing that, and um, this too goes to the credit and imagination of the UN and, and of member states. Nevertheless, given how vital this is for our, our protection efforts, our system is not the system that we need. Um, it's a system which applies very unevenly to different situations. It's a system which um, suffers from tremendous delays um, over months, sometimes years, while political consensus is sought. Um, the delays also lead to compromise. Um, it's a system that we find very difficult to, to sustain. We might be able to focus tremendous political pressure um, during one week or maybe one month on a particular country we find it very difficult to sustain that pressure over six months, over a year, and to do so over five or six or seven or ten different situations at the same time. Um, Sub-regional states are vital actors in ensuring there is political pressure applied to parties. We're seeing that in uh, southern Sudan at the moment. And yet sub-regional states are often excluded from the, the, certainly from the formal mechanisms of generating political pressure and sometimes from the quasi-informal ones. Um, so the, the big message then is, uh, is my sense certainly that the, in parallel with the excellent work being done by DPKO, OCHA and others, um, the, the next frontier of POC is is arguably a, a much strengthened means of gathering political pressure and applying it and, and having a capacity to, to sustain that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ben. Then, uh, finally, uh, will be a couple of you will have the opportunity to ask questions to this excellent panel. So please, if you are very quick, you will have the opportunity. <laughs> First, we start with the lady in the front, and then there is a man in the back, and uh, one more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eva Smets. Uh, I'm the director for uh, Watchlist on Children and Armed Conflict. It's a network of non-governmental organizations working on children in armed conflict. I want to thank the panel. These were excellent presentations. And in particular, I wanted to thank Captain Erblund and Colonel Kyugu, who of course faced these issues uh, uh, firsthand in the field. And I was particularly struck by the examples uh, that you gave that actually spoke about the situation of children in these conflicts, especially the example of Captain Erblund of the insurgents crossing the river holding each the hands uh, of children. So it's a stark reminder that peacekeepers, that soldiers on the battleground really are usually the first point of contact of children in situations of armed conflict with the international community. Now, given this reality, and also given the fact that just providing general protection of civilians for the general population is already so challenging, as each of you uh, have highlighted, I'm interested in hearing the perspectives of the different panelists of how the one single thing from your experience that you would recommend that we can implement in order to better prepare troops when they go into these situations uh, to ensure that they can provide uh, specific uh, attention for issues that face children in situations of armed conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Then, yes, please, the man in back. 
Hi there, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dave Buffalo. I'm the military advisor to the US Department of State in Washington. Um, I want to reference the recent UN OIOS report that came out that largely stated something that we all knew uh, inherently, that there was a wide gap between the aspirations of the UN Security Council, the UN Secretariat, and, also, and those who are on the ground implementing protection of civilians, whether it's at the uh, force command level or many of the, the troop contributing nations. I, I've got a uh, two-part question mainly directed to David, and that is, what, what will we do to eliminate that gap uh, between the aspirations and the, and the uh, actions on the ground? And second, to ask his comments on, on uh, Colonel Kyogo's uh, uh, comment about the, uh, the caveats, the national caveats. Personally, as a pragmatist, uh, a force planner, I would prefer to know up front if a troop contributing country was unwilling to take the active role necessary uh, in, in protecting civilians. To know that up front as a force commander or as a DPKO, relegate them perhaps to a passive role and, and put those, uh, those troop contributing countries who are willing and understand the risks necessary um, in that active role. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the lady here. Thank you. Alison Hayes. I work for the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict. It's a very similar question, actually, to the one that was just asked, um, but following up on a phrase that Ambassador Evans used about changing the mindset. Um, I know from peacekeeping missions the enormous appetite and need for further training, further guidance, and that's all been very welcome and very practical. Um, but how do we, where I stumble is, how do we go beyond that to the mindsets of the, of the TCCs? And Kenya is one of the largest contributing countries when you, know, you send a force commander or a police commissioner, how do we get beyond that to the way they think about the rules of engagement? Um, and as I was listening to the captain's presentation, I was thinking maybe it is something around military ethics. Maybe it's, I don't know, is it something in the performance appraisal or in the agreement between the country and the UN? I just don't know. I draw a blank. Um, but it's, it's certainly something uh, that, that uh, you know, is the biggest challenge for us. We have time for two more quick questions. One gentleman at the back there, two gentlemen there, and that's cool. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Rahul Sur. My name is uh, Rahul Sur. I am the uh, Chief of Peacekeeping Evaluation in the Office of Internal Oversight Services. And yes. Uh, my name is Rahul Sur. I'm the Chief of uh, Peacekeeping Evaluation in the Office of Internal Oversight Services. Uh, the report which was referenced by the gentleman on my left, in fact, is a report of our office, which overall looks at, uh, overall looks at issues of relevance, efficiency, effectiveness, and impact on peacekeeping in various facets of it. Uh, this report is a publicly available report. Uh, the number is 8. A slash 68 slash 787. And uh, the title of the report is on the implementation and results of protection of civilians. And one of the sentences which encapsulates the report is that peacekeeping missions with the protection of civilian mandates focus on prevention and mitigation and forces almost never used to protect civilians under attack. Uh, this report also goes into the questions behind this very challenging topic and also recognizes the long-term successes of peacekeeping in protecting civilians, the importance of the political aspect and the results achieved. But uh, this is a publicly available report and we would be happy to, uh, to engage in a discussion should the participants think uh, that this is a contribution to the overall debate. Thank you. I'm General Patrick Hamad, the former military advisor in DPKO and um, General Officer Command of the Eastern Division in Monuk. Um, we've heard this morning excellent presentations, a lot about the issuing of guidelines and policies, etc. There are a lot of guidelines in the half eight years and policies. Um, Mandates and rules of engagement are very clear, but the mandate is as strong as the will of the leadership and the troop contributor to implement it. And I have not heard so many times the word will. If that political will is not there, troop contributing countries on the ground will not be proactive to prevent and preempt atrocities to take place. 
The culmination point in 2012, in December 2012, when the M23 marched into Goma, was um, not an isolated issue. It was a trend. Have we really investigated what went wrong there? Is there an external investigation and assessment? What went wrong? Why did the troop contributing countries not implement that mandate? Or w when the FARDC ran away, then suddenly the United Nations, MONUSCO, said we have no mandate to protect civilians anymore. That resulted in a frustrated Security Council providing a fourth intervention brigade. But the fourth intervention brigade is only a handful of countries that are willing to simply implement the mandate that was already given with the rules of engagement that give you the use of force beyond self-defense. If that will is not there, we can sit here and have next week another seminar, but nothing will change unless we really concentrate on the performance of the troop contributors, we fail to protect civilians under imminent threat, including from sexual violence. Thank you to all of you for excellent questions. I will now give the impossible task to the panel to answer in one minute all these questions. So, you know, you better prepare yourself. <laughs> and uh, I will uh, start with Ambassador Evans, please. I'll just pick up on the point about mindset. I think um, my sense is that it's all about train early, train deep. Make sure that um, young men and women, when they join the armed forces, get the right training on ethical issues, issues surrounding the protection of civilians, protection of children, the protection of the most vulnerable during their basic training, focus on young officers in the military academy, and then once you've inculcated that basic understanding of these issues, give the young men and women the opportunity to discuss them from an ethical point of view. You don't teach ethics. You encourage people to come to their own ethical judgments and valuations as a result of discussion. And then when they go on an operation, make sure that these issues are surfaced again during the pre-deployment training and focused in real-world environments. What would you actually do if you were in a certain village, there was a gunman there, and there's a woman and a child there? Make sure that they just think it through, and then when they get in the field, they will be more familiar with, more comfortable with the issues, and they will have sorted these ideas out in their own minds and in their own discussions with their comrades through basically a sense of shared values, and that will help them approach the mission that they'll be undertaking. Thank you. Well done. Uh, Captain Evelyn, at least one question to you. Yeah, about the first question on children. Um, well, I don't think there is a, a clear solution, but um, first of all, we can learn about um, the local culture and try to understand better uh, their way of life. And secondly, um, we can learn soldiers to really take care of children uh, in a medical way. I mean, um, in Afghanistan, uh, we, uh, we had a, a lot of Afghan ch children in the military hospital in Kabul. Um, and I was once uh, called to, to do a, a medical evacuation um, in a valley for a, for a child. And um, the, military, the military doctors uh, managed to, to, to save this child. And the day after, all the men of the village uh, came to the nearest fob and, and gave, them, gave our soldiers a, a machine gun. So taking care of local children can help to succeed in operation. Thank, thank you very much. And now, uh, Colonel Kyogo, we look forward to hearing you all. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Basin. I'll touch on the first one and uh, on ethics. And what I, I'll, I'll share the sentiment of, um, of um, um, yeah, uh, Pedersen, yeah, Evans, that it, it brings, it comes down to training. You know, talking about uh, ethics and talking about the way you will treat uh, children when you go to peacekeeping missions reflects on exactly the way your troops behave even back home. So the way your troops treat civilians back home is exactly the way they are likely to treat them when they are deployed to peacekeeping missions. Mm. 
There's no, so I think that, that is my short answer. Thank you very much. And last but not least, David. So you will now be answering all the questions. Uh, yeah, in, in one minute. Um, I'll, I'll try to be very, very brief. Um, on, on training and uh, related to child protection, um, I agree it's very difficult uh, for uh, soldiers to know that they face lots of situations. The question of children uh, uh, mitigating uh, risk to children in the midst of operations, the question of children who may uh, uh, approach them, uh, the question of children who are part of militia groups and DDR. Um, we just actually, uh, in, the, in the training which um, uh, Brigadier General Trishak was uh, referring to, uh, we actually just launched a POC uh, component on, uh, sorry, a ch child protection component, which we can offer within POC training or, or uh, also as a standalone. And we've just come back from that first experience and we'll do a wash up and, and try to propagate that. So that's, that's, of course, one element. Also within the missions, there are um, a number of actors that come together in the monitoring and reporting mechanism, which you're no doubt aware of, that brings together UNICEF, uh, the mission, and all other actors. Uh, looking at monitoring and reporting on uh, the, 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 the key violations. Um, and I think it all comes down again to combined joined up strategy making which identifies the types of threats that are there and brings all of the elements of the mission to bear. I can't stress this enough. Uh, as I said, on the one hand, the signal difference of a peacekeeping mission is the troops and so we need to look at physical protection. But the kinds of things you're talking about will fall to the troops but also to the civil affairs officers, also the human rights officers, uh, the, the, the agencies, funds and programs on, on the ground. And it needs to be a holistic approach. Even if the soldier knows what to do with the children that come out of the, of the bush, uh, who, who does the soldier give that child over to? Who comes with the, the expertise? So it, it, it needs to be uh, a holistic approach. And that's why uh, that kind of cross-mission uh, work which is being done is important. And it is something which I think UNICEF and uh, the child protection components of peacekeeping missions have long-standing comparative advantage coordinated approaches on. Sometimes people say, why does a mission have child protection? There's an organization called UNICEF. Well, if you go to UNICEF, they'll say they absolutely want the mission to have child protection, precisely for the reasons you're talking about, so that there can be a holistic approach that moves within the mission and beyond the mission with the country team. Um, on the OIOS report, um, uh, we take the report very uh, seriously. We work closely with Rahul uh, on it. Um, and I think we, you know, the, the, the main recommendations, one was on reporting. Uh, clarifying uh, military guidance, uh, which we will be doing uh, on terms of reporting uh, incidents to UNHQ. Uh, the second on training, um, so that we will uh, review our training materials. And the third was on integration with OCHA, which is in fact a very long standing and deep level of integration, uh, including a standing group at, uh, in New York, including structures on the ground. I was just at Montreux with the triple hatted DSRSG RCHCs talking about this issue. So there are lots of structures there, but we will remind uh, um, uh, OCHA that we need to re revamp and look at these existing mechanisms, because I think the, the OIOS team picked up uh, concerns on the ground, and it is an ongoing uh, difficult issue, balancing humanitarian space and coordination. But to the heart of your question, um, you know, I think that uh, it's absolutely correct that, you know, given the things that were said uh, by the other panel members, we need to make sure there's a strong understanding and consensus by our TCCs on the nature of the mission, on the risks that will be there, and that there aren't national caveats in, in place. If there are, we need to know those up front and not in the moment of crisis. So absolutely agree with that. We did have a discussion, we had a discussion with OIOS though on the focus of the report solely on, on use of force. That is not to say that I don't believe use of force is, is important. I, again, I will repeat, it is the one thing that a peacekeeping mission will ultimately be judged on. Not use of force alone, but physical protection, preventive deployment, patrolling, et cetera. And ultimately, that element too. The one thing I would, the, the, the bone I have to pick with the OAS report on methodology, though, is that we do need to have the holistic approach. That is what we are asking missions to undertake. The political element is important. Uh, the, the preventive element is important. And I recognize the report uh, itself recognized advances and gains made on prevention, on training and guidance, et cetera. Um, but I think that if you really want to bury down, burrow down into the question of use of force, you need to begin to unpick the ROEs and the sorts of things which have been discussed already. And that maybe could, could, could be done a little bit more 
uh, more closely. Uh, so it's not to say that I disagree with the fundamental issue being a concern, but I do think that methodologically uh, there are some issues around the use of force that we may need to look at uh, more closely that have been looked at in the robust uh, 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 peacekeeping discussions which have, have undertaken. I won't, uh, Alison, I won't take your question on mindset of TCCs because I think that was already taken, but I did mention, and I do agree with you, uh, General Kamer, ultimately, as I think I said at the last point of my, my, my opening statement, it is about mindset and will and what is going to be uh, done there. So I completely, I completely agree with that, and that is the irreplaceable thing. You don't necessarily train your way out of it either. I did think it does go to, to, uh, uh, to political understanding, and that needs to be constantly worked at. These are not simple situations our missions face. There isn't a simple answer, use force or don't use force in any one situation. It is about whether the mission is leaning in and taking all the risks that it can, uh, but also understanding the limitations of that, uh, which are, are always very real. And I think that is something which a constant dialogue between the council, the secretariat, and the mission uh, will, will, uh, will, will require. Uh, maybe I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think it's been an excellent uh, panel, and I think they deserve uh, a hand.